Okay. Oh, Jerry, we got to get you unmuted. There you go. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction. And um, thank you for the opportunity to share something that I'm passionate about. Um, like you said, last year, um, our school, we were one week in, one week out with um, COVID protocols. So, um, you know, doing an independent study was a little bit challenging, but uh, my advisor, Mr. Nichols, um, who was my AP biology teacher last year, um, he really did a wonderful job in um, moving this project along and helping me out with that. Um, so like you said, I'm a senior um, at Penn Charter. Um, I play football and I'm a resident on Brookline. Um, and last year during my AP biology, AP biology curriculum, um, I set up with Mr. Nichols um, an independent study looking more closely into CRISPR-Cas9, which um, you know is something that's been a hot topic um, in the media, in the scientific world uh, recently. And it's a fairly new concept. So um, that's something that I really wanted to explore, you know, the inner mechanisms and the applications um, in current research. Um, so without further ado, I will present um, a slideshow that I created primarily last year um, to present on this topic. All right. Here we go. So my presentation is titled the code, of, the code of Life, Understanding the Rise of CRISPR-Cas9. Um, so primarily I will explore sort of the inner mechanisms of the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which is um, a biological process for gene editing which originated in um, bacteria as sort of a defense mechanism against bacteriophages, um, types of viruses. Um, I'll explore those sorts of natural origins and then um, the research that led to CRISPR-Cas9 being um, sort of co-opted for scientific purposes, uh, for diseases and for certain um, you know, genetic applications. And then I'll also explore sort of some of uh, the ethical dilemmas that CRISPR poses, um, you know, with all the potential that it holds. So I will give some background information on DNA and RNA. Um, so DNA is what stores our genetic information. Uh, it's a nucleic acid. Um, and DNA is primarily aligned in anti-parallel complementary pairings. Um, there's a representation at the bottom of the screen right there. Um, and it is uniquely special um, and you know the reason why sort of gene editing and this connection with CRISPR-Cas9 um, is possible is because DNA is a universal genetic code. Um, for almost every um, living organism, DNA, um, the same type of DNA, um, the same molecules are used as a genetic code. Um, and then a derivative, a sort of derivative of DNA is RNA. Um, which serves to transfer the information stored in DNA through the transcription and translation processes, and is also used in um, sort of pro prokaryotic organisms, which are smaller organisms, um, to carry their genetic information. Um, and if you look at the image at the bottom right of the screen, you can see sort of the main differences between DNA and RNA. Um, DNA the, is composed of um, a sugar base, which is in DNA's case, deoxyribose and in RNA ribose, um, connected to a phosphate group. And then what um, gives DNA the coding properties is the different nitrogenous bases that it uses, um, represented by C, G, A, T, um, T, right? And that's cytosine, guanine, adenine, thymine. Um, and RNA, thymine is replaced by uracil. And so DNA is a primary mechanism for storing this information whereas RNA is used sort of in the transfer of that information to proteins and uh, you know, real effects. And there's uh, many different types of RNA that's used within the cell. Um, for instance, mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA, which are used in you know, um, uh, trans transferring the information of DNA as well as um, sort of turning that into proteins. But what uh, we will primary fo primarily focus on um, in this presentation is guide RNA um, at the bottom which uh, is used by, by the Cas9 enzyme, um, a protein, to um, direct itself to a specific uh, sequence of DNA. And that's how it sort of has its 
uh, targeting abilities to a specific sequence. So directionality, um, once again, DNA is composed in um, anti-parallel strands going from five prime to three prime and three prime to five prime um, relatively. And that sort of has to do with um, the carbon structure of the sugar bases um, and how it's uh, synthesized um, in DNA synthesis. But then uh, what that also results in is sort of the properties of, um, you know, having what we'll talk about next, DNA palindromes, which are, you know, um, repeated sequ sequences back and forth, which um, are used by CRISPR to, um, you know, cut specific sequences of the DNA. So the word, the word CRISPR-Cas9, what does that um, represent? So CRISPR is an acronym. It stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Um, and that's the method for the sequence identification in the DNA. Um, it's you know, sort of a pattern of those nitrogenous bases. Um, a, G, C, T, um, you know, that palindromic um, repeat. And so Cas9 is actually a physical protein. Um, it's an enzyme. And it is what physically slices through the DNA backbone um, and is guided by that sequence of RNA. Right, so um, palindromes and examples presented at the bottom. Um, these repeated sequences are detected by the Cas9 protein. Um, and when it's uh, transcribed into RNA, it creates sort of a hairpin loop, which I will uh, present later, um, which guides the Cas9 protein. Um, and these, these palindromes are separated by spacer DNA, which is the targeted segment that codes for a specific gene, a specific trait um, that, you know, we want to target with this uh, system. All right. So the Cas9 dyed RNA complex. So the unbonded Cas9 protein is not specialized towards any specific se uh, sequence but it's just capable of cutting through DNA. Um, the guide RNA segment, which includes the spacer and the palindrome, um, which is templated from target DNA, um, connects to the Cas9 protein and sort of creates um, a complex which searches for and recognizes that target DNA and then um, cuts it at a specific site. Um, so this is a representation of the Cas9 guide RNA complex. Um, if you look at sort of the pink, um, the pink DNA segment, that is the hairpin loop, um, the guide RNA. So that is what is um, used to target specific sequences. And then um, at that specific cleavage spot um, with the red arrows, that is where the Cas9 protein will cut um, the target DNA. And then at the bottom is sort of some mechanisms for repairing that DNA once it's cut. Um, and one key um, sort of minor factor um, of this system, which is really crucial to um, you know, the process as a whole is PAM regulation. Um, so PAM stands for protospacer adjacent motif sequence. And um, this is a sequence of nucleotides, which is usually only a few um, nucleotides long. But what this does is it signals for the final cut. So once a sequence is recognized by the, the Cas9 protein, um, it isn't cut until um, it detects this PAM sequence. So what this does is it prevents um, that specific sequence somewhere else in the organism's DNA from being cut without um, you know, purpose, without it being the, the correct um, DNA. So now we'll sort of get into a timeline of research with CRISPR. Um, so in 1987 was really when the first identification of these palindrome sequences was detected by Japanese researchers um, in a strain of E. coli. And um, at that point, they didn't know what the purpose of these um, palindromic repeats was. Um, they didn't you know, have any reason to suspect it would be for gene editing, but um, they noticed that you know, these repeats are not random. There's a purpose to them. And so with further research, um, there was the identification of these repeats in other strains of bacteria, um, which sort of indicates that it's a widespread bacterial phenomenon and not unique to E. coli. 
So in the early 2000s was when the CRISPR-Cas9 system was really seen as a whole to be a bacterial immune response to bacteriophages. Um, and then later in 2012 is really when um, the big research starts to come out with um, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. They win a Nobel Prize for their research um, where they sort of co-opt CRISPR um, as a method for gene editing. Um, and they use that in a, to like a targeted method. Um, so not, not randomly. And then um, 2015 is when we start to see sort of um, experiments and um, the use of CRISPR-Cas9 in humans and for um, medical purposes. And then, you know, going into the present, there have been various um, applications in the medical field um, and ongoing research regarding CRISPR. Right, so CRISPR-Cas9's specific role in nature is defense against bacteriophages. Um, bacteriophages, they infect um, the host cell, the host bacterial cell by injecting their DNA and re relying on the bacteria's mechanisms to reproduce itself. Um, and doing so, it destroys uh, the bacterial cell. So what CRISPR-Cas9 does, and specifically the CRISPR system in general, because there are also other proteins which are responsible for this um, process, they detect um, this viral DNA and they, st they store it in their own genome. Um, and when that, when that, um, I'm sorry, they create these Cas9 um, guide RNA complexes with the detected um, DNA. And then when that DNA is later detected within the cell, um, CRISPR-Cas9 um, detects that and cuts it, uh, rendering the viral DNA um, unable to infect it. And this immunity is also passed um, to bacterial offspring. So it's sort of, um, you know, inherited immunity for bacteria. This is, uh, you know, some images of that process. On the left, you see a bacteriophage um, infecting bacterial cell. And then on the right is the process for storing that, uh, that DNA and then later recalling it so it can um, defend against bacteriophages. So there are three stages of this process, which is uh, first we have sequence bank banking. Um, the Cas1 and 2 proteins are responsible for cutting the viral segments of DNA and inserting it into um, the CRISPR region of a bacteria's um, plasma genome, which is sort of a circle of DNA. Um, this creates a memory bank. And then with that information, they arm a Cas9 protein um, to detect this sequence of DNA. Um, and then once it is detected, the Cas9 complex cuts the DNA and destroys it. Um, there's no repair in this um, natural application, the, the, you know, the original um, purpose for CRISPR. All right, and yeah, this is another representation um, from our textbook of this process. So there are repair mechanisms that the cell has um, outside of CRISPR, um, sort of not related. Um, and the one that uh, we will focus on is HDR, homology directed repair, um, which uses a complementary strand of that DNA as a template for um, repairing the DNA that was cut. Um, and in the specific strain of E. coli that we use um, later for our experiment, um, there, it requires arabinose to induce this repairing process. Um, so without the arabinose, um, we'll see in later experiments, um, the bacteria cannot repair its own DNA. Um, so yeah, this all came, this was all, um, this was all sort of initialized by um, the research by Down on Charpentier, um, as well as, um, sort of later research, which also clarified on the process um, and use it for different purposes, uh, you know, isolating this, this CRISPR-Cas9 um, complex and demonstrating it can be used for specific sequences. Um, this was done uh, by the work of Janek, Zhang, Church, and 
uh, six knees. And so a key part of um, our CRISPR cast iron research and why it is um, you know, so relevant and so important is because um, it's CRISPR Cas9 has sort of made um, you know an incredibly rare jump in the scientific world from being um, an experimental technology, um, you know, being a, a breakthrough in the field to being accessible in my own high school classroom. Um, and this is you know usually not common for any sort of biological breakthrough like this. And the reason for this is because um, the system actually exists within the bacteria. Um, you don't need um, specific, very complex genetic engineering to produce um, a CRISPR-Cas9 complex. Um, it is within the E. coli that um, you can get from, you know, a variety of uh, laboratory material producers. And so, this was also aided by an exponential growth of research into understanding CRISPR. Um, it sort of had, you know, you could say a boom in the biological field um, when uh, the Nobel Prize work sort of was released um, in 2012. And then um, it, you can also contribute it to the current state of genome sequencing and plasma engineering, um, which has already been developed for um, many decades and the advancement that we have in those areas. And so one of the main points um, of our experiment was comparing the use of CRISPR-Cas9 to edit genomes to a typical um, gene transformation with bacteria, which is actually very common um, in high school biology classes. Um, and what a typical gene transformation looks like is you will have um, colonies of bacteria like E. coli, and you will insert them in sort of a solution of uh, calcium chloride, I believe, which will sort of shock the cells into um, opening their, their, their outer pores. And then what you do is you sort of flood them with, um, with DNA plasmids and um, sort of hope that they enter through um, the cell and become a part of that cell's genome. Um, but the difference with CRISPR is that um, it's capable of knocking out um, specific genes, which has its own applications, and can also be um, extremely more efficient than a typical gene transformation, um, as well as the fact that it's applicable to eukaryotic organisms like humans and animals, unlike um, a simple bacterial transformation. So the methods of the experiment that um, Mr. Nichols and I uh, performed last year in the spring, um, we ordered colonies of E. coli, um, which were cultured with a functional lax Z gene. And what the lax Z gene is, is um, a gene that produces functional digestion of lactose. Um, and this is experiment we use sort of um, a similar, um, a similar substance uh, called XGAL, which um, when digested results in a blue color. So you can see the results of that experiment. Um, some of these cultures were given guide RNA to direct CRISPR-Cas9, which would induce that cutting process. Um, two out of the four plates that um, we'll look at were given that. And then one of each of those plates were given arabinose um, to promote the homology-directed repair that would cause for um, repair of that cut cell and then um, growth of those colonies. And then these cultures were plated on agar plates, which are typical of um, you know, cellular experimentation, and they were plated with an antibiotic that selects for E. coli. So we know that there's no other um, bacterial species that are grown on that plate. These are some pictures of, um, you know, the equipment that we used, what we ordered from BioRed for this experiment. Um, I believe that the name of this um, specific set was out of the blue um, CRISPR kit. Um, and that was actually, um, you know, relative to how new CRISPR is, that was very cheap, um, for a biological experiment. I think it was somewhere in, um, the low hundreds, maybe $200. Um, and so if you see the top right, that's a, that's a plate of bacterial colonies, which, um, have a functional X or a functional laxy gene digesting that XGAL. 
And then at the bottom, we have um, these donor plasmids with the guide RNA that were given to um, the colonies of bacteria to promote CRISPR-Cas9 cutting. And so this is um, our first set of plates, which have experienced blue colony growth. These plates specifically were not given guide RNA. So the CRISPR-Cas9 system was not um, induced and they were also given no arabinus as a control group. So the second set of plates, they were given guide RNA to induce CRISPR-Cas9 cutting of the genome, but they weren't given arabinos to promote that um, homology directed repair. So what happened was um, the DNA of these bacteria were cut, but they were not repaired. So the bacteria um, colonies could not grow, they died. Um, this third set of plates was not given um, guide RNA. So they did not undergo CRISPR-Cas9 cutting, but they were given arabinos as another control group. And you can see that um, the two plates that have grown uh, bacterial colonies, they have both appeared blue. So they have a functional laxi, uh, laxi gene. And then this final um, set of plates was uh, the, you know, the specific treatment group. Um, they were given the guide RNA. So they underwent CRISPR-Cas9 cutting and they were also given arabinose to promote repair of that, um, those DNA segments. And as you can see um, on the plates, all of the colonies, while there are less of them, all of the colonies that have grown are white. So what that signifies is that the lax E gene in all of those um, bacterial colonies was effectively um, cut out and then had their DNA repaired. And this is um, sort of, this is a view of all of those plates, um, one from each of those groups uh, laid out together. And then this is yeah, sort of a summary of what I just said about um, you know, the different control plates and then the white colonies, which were completely uniform um, and demonstrated the efficiency of Cas9 um, of cutting out those specific genes and then repairing um, the DNA through homology-directed repair. So um, the efficiency of this transformation is a key um, comparison between a typical bacterial transformation, um, the traditional gene transformation, which I uh, mentioned earlier as being typical to high school classrooms, it's much less efficient um, and produces a mix of transformed and untransformed colonies. So you see a mix of blue and white um, and you would have um, in total much less um, treated or transformed colonies. Um, and this is important for um, you know, processes that require density or uniform, uniformity standards where um, it's not possible to have that mix of uh, transformed and untransformed colonies. And so now we're gonna uh, sort of go into the biomedical applications um, of CRISPR that have been um, researched um, in recent years, I would say within the last three years um, and have been, um, and that had been applied to um, you know, the medical world. So the, these, these treatments are um, up for human testing and they have shown signs of effectiveness. So first we're gonna talk about sickle cell anemia. Um, sickle cell anemia is caused by a mutation in the BCL11A gene which is what switches bone marrow production of hemoglobin um, to the adult version. So with um, hemoglobin production, you have genes for adult hemoglobin and fetal hemoglobin, um, which is produced by another gene. And with this mutation for sickle cell anemia, it only affects um, adult hemoglobin. So what this treatment um, intends to do is knock out the gene that's responsible for um, switching over to adult hemoglobin production and which would then revert back to that fetal hemoglobin production, um, which would then cause um, production of non-sickled cells, even, if so, even in someone who is affected by this disease. Um, and at the bottom, you can see this is called an ex vivo method because um, what the treatment does is takes the bone marrow out of the patient, um, treats it with uh, these CRISPR-Cas9 complexes, and then returns it into the patient's body for production. So secondly, we have retinal dystrophy. 
um, which has actually just been approved for human trial, um, these treatments. And so uh, with some cases of renal dystrophy, uh, some cells have a sequence error in their DNA, which causes um, rapid degeneration. And with a CRISPR treatment, um, it's used to cut out these affected genes and um, rely only on the ones that are not affected by the specific sequence. Um, and this is um, differently from sickle cell anemia. This is an in, an in vivo method, which relies on um, homology directed repair to um, cut out those cells and then repair them with um, those template DNAs, uh, those template DNA strands from um, other cells nearby. And then thirdly, um, we sort of get into CRISPR being used as a diagnostic tool for diseases. Um, and this is represented by the Sherlock system, which was developed to detect dengue viruses, Zika viruses, and HPV strains associated with cancer. Um, it uses actually a Cas13 pro uh, enzyme, sorry, which um, is very similar to the Cas9 protein, but um, the main difference is that once it detects that target sequence, it cuts the DNA and sort of just keeps cutting at random, um, chopping up the rest of that DNA sequence. And so what this is used for is when it detects that sequence, uh, that, that specific DNA sequence in the viral genome, it starts you know, cutting up at random, creating um, a detectable dark band of DNA segments which can um, you know, indicate the presence of, the, of those viruses. And this is uh, specifically important for testing in undeveloped or rural regions um, where those long laboratory dependent processes of um, diagnosing uh, these different viruses would be um, impossible. And then we sort of get into other environmental and agricultural applications outside of the medical field. Um, CRISPR has been successfully used to um, reduce the methane and greenhouse gas emissions of crops, particularly rice fields, um, creating these varieties of rice, which um, yield lower emissions, um, as well as it's been used to knock out a gene in mushrooms, as well as, I believe, uh, tomatoes and other types of plants, which cause them to brown and sort of become undesirable for a grocery store to sell. Um, and in effect, this increases the shelf life of those foods and reduces waste. Um, and I would say it's important to note that um, CRISPR-Cas9 is, um, is not defined as a GMO, a uh, genetically modified organism, because it does not introduce any foreign sequences to um, these organisms. It only cuts out the specific um, sequences that it's targeted towards. So, um, all of these organisms that are affected by CRISPR-Cas9, they, um, their genes are entirely the same as, um, you know, what it had originally, just, um, you know, cut from some specific sequences. All right, so now we'll get into the ethical concerns of CRISPR-Cas9 that have sort of emerged um, more recently than um, you know, CRISPR has been researched, I would say, um, in 2015 is when, you know, you really started to get some, um, widespread ethical concerns about, co uh, about CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and first of all, that's due to some off-target effects that have been detected, um, using CRISPR-Cas9. Um, so while it is, um, very rare and actually, um, less frequent than other methods for, uh, gene man manipulation. There are um, cases where um, there's interference with non-targeted sequences or um, inadvertent, inadvertently um, similar sequences within the, uh, the genome that causes um, cuts at the wrong place, basically. Um, and of course, you know, messing with um, the DNA of, of really any organism can have uh, serious repercussions for, um, you know, that organism's um, life and um, reproduction. So there's also um, a lack of long-term study on the, these alternative effects of uh, gene therapy, you know, off-target effects, as well as um, what what effects it could have on the organism on the organism as a whole um, in the long term. 
and there have been studies um, in animals that are that suggest that um, being treated with CRISPR-Cas9 can lower the cancer fighting ability in treated cells. Um, so with cells, their, their method for fighting cancer is called um, apoptosis, which is coded into the cell. Um, and when it, when it detects certain um, defects and genetic mutations, it actually goes into programmed cell death um, to prevent cancerous cells. And there are studies that suggest that this was um, sort of altered by the CRISPR-Cas9 process though um, there's no evidence for that in humans um, as of yet. So secondly, we come to um, you know, topics of malicious intent with CRISPR and sort of um, expanding the boundaries of scientific research at this moment. Um, the greatest and I would say most well-known example of that is um, you know, what, the, what the media has labeled CRISPR babies. Um, and that is referring to a Chinese scientist um, Hei Jiang uh, Kuei, who was arrested actually for um, supposedly, he, um, he claimed this, but it was actually never confirmed um, that he edited a gene related to HIV infection um, in a pair of embryos in China. Um, and then, so, uh, you know, the ethical concerns regarding that is sort of, um, you know, how do we regulate um, manipulating the genetic, the genetic code of embryos and, um, humans, um, when, um, you know, it's not a, um, you know, consensual treatment, um, for a disease. It's, it's a proactive, um, uh, treatment for, um, a tendency towards HIV infection, which, um, also has the, the possibility of, um, you know, descending into, um, eugenics applications and sort of, um, you know, the God complex for, you know, any rogue scientists for manipulating um, the human genome, um, as well as, you know, expanding the boundaries of current scientific research. Um, you know, with, with CRISPR came sort of a new era of molecular biology, um, and specifically the, you know, internationally, um, there's a lack of specific regulation towards CRISPR-Cas9, as you would see with other specific um, gene editing topics or um, many other topics in the biological field. Um, so, you know, with that, that new potential and all the possibilities that CRISPR holds, um, there's also, you know, the potential to do real harm to, you know, the fundamental building block of um, human life, of um, life as a whole. So, um, there have been um, very strong um, pushes to um, regulate CRISPR's uh, research more stringently. And, um, you know, that is something that will continue into the future as more applications are discovered. So looking into the future, um, there are sort of two ways that we can look at CRISPR-Cas9, um, depending on its future. We can look at it as, as uh, you know, a continuous groundbreaker um, in, you know, different applications in the medical field, um, the environmental field, um, you know, creating these different possibilities for solving, solving issues. And we can also look at it as a stepping stone to, um, you know, the, the entire field of gene editing, um, because, you know, there are various methods for editing, um, DNA. Um, CRISPR has just proven to be the most effective and most efficient, um, method as of yet. But um, you know, with with this being such a such a um, you know groundbreaking field, such a relatively young field, there's always a possibility for the discovery of a different method um, and different possibilities. Um, either way, we can definitely look at CRISPR as being um, sort of a fundamental stepping stone for diving into you know modern genetic research and looking at the processes. Um, that we use to edit the genome. All right, and um, with that, I'll just open it up to any questions, um, anything that you would like to clarify on. Um, yeah. Feel free just to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Um, it's up to you. Questions for Jerry?
I guess I'm curious about the original um, uses for, for bacteria. Um, I was wondering um, if you could give us some examples of how it was used uh, or when it was first identified. What, what were the hopes um, with those applications at the beginning? Right. So um, you're talking about like specific scientific um, applications rather than like, you know, biological and natural right. applications. Right. So um, let's, go, let's go back to that slide. Right. So um, Downa yeah. and Charpentier were, um, you know, they were very forward looking in their research. Um, they specifically looked at, you know, all the possible applications for organisms other than bacteria in their research. Um, but I would say before that, um, research almost completely focused around um, the use of CRISPR-Cas9 in bacteria, um, because um, despite the fact that DNA is universal, um, and those same systems can be applied to pretty much any organism. Um, no one really thought that you could use this um, bacterial defense mechanism to manipulate, you know, eukaryotic organisms um, that are much more complex and um, just sort of unpredictable um, in that type of research. So um, I would say at first, um, CRISPR-Cas9 was primarily um, thought to be you know, a potential way to um, manipulate, you know, like laboratory specimens of bacteria um, to have specific qualities um, so that they could be better researched. Um, they were better suited for different kinds of research that uh, may not even be related to, um, you know, CRISPR, um, as well as, you know, other applications that we have for bacteria in the medical field, such as um, I know that um, in the uh, you know, large scale insulin production, um, bacteria is actually used as a way to um, insert the genes for um, insulin production from pigs into these um, bacterial um, specimens, which then produce it as at, at a larger scale, which um, I think sort of applications like that, where we, where we um, you know, sort of utilize um, bacterial qualities for human benefit, I think those were the primary considerations um, in, you know, COVID research, or sorry, not COVID, CRISPR. Um, and I believe that, um, that in the modern day, we do use um, CRISPR-Cas9 for the most part to um, synthesize insulin. There's a, a question in the chat. Um, that says what other human diseases may be treated with this technology and would those treatments likely be in, be in, viv, in vivo or ex vivo? I hope I said that right. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's actually a really great question. And that is, um, you know, the, the, the key part of CRISPR. And that's why it's, it's so important because um, there's a variety of applications um, with, you know, genetic modification. And so my answer to that would be, I would say any disease um, that is caused by a genetic mutation. Um, so if I can just maybe think of some, um, you know, you have um, a variety of blood diseases, um, which, you know, relate to hemoglobin production um, and um, sort of um, things like that, as well as we're starting to see some research into the genetic component of uh, neurodegenerative diseases, such as um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, and while there's, there's no specific treatment for um, those diseases as of yet, um, there's definitely research into um, the possibility of targeting specific uh, DNA sequences with those diseases, as well as, um, I believe, um, things like uh, muscular dystrophy, um, you know, th that sort of relates to retinal dystrophy with um, those mutated sequences in those cells, which cause, um, you know, the, the cellular deterioration. So um, as, as it relates to in vivo versus ex vivo, um, I would say that for the most part, um, ex vivo is the most, the most practical way to treat many of these diseases just because um, 
it's, it's sort of hard to utilize CRISPR Cas9 in a widespread method within the body because, um, you know, when you're editing those, you know, editing those um, specific um, cellular genomes, um, that's hard to do at, you know, a wide scale. You, you couldn't really um, sort of, you know, just look at your muscle and sort of um, implant some solution of a CRISPR Cas9 complex that would then go and affect every single muscular cell. Um, in your arm, um, that, yeah, that, that would be sort of more impractical, but what, um, you know, what the solution to a lot of these things will be, I, I mean, I believe is that, um, in areas of your body, which, which have, um, you know, you could say, um, specialized cells like, um, your retina or your brain or your, your nerve cells, those are cells where you could go. And I think, use an in vivo approach to manipulate those cells uh, specifically because they don't reproduce um, and they're more limited in number. But I believe in, um, you know, the, the key um, focal point will be uh, being able to take cells out of the body, um, manipulate them, and then um, re-implant them back into the body where they can reproduce and, um, you know, reproduce those uh, edited genomes. Other questions? Hey, Jerry, I have a question for you. First of all, congratulations, yeah. terrific <laughs> presentation. You made Thank a you. really difficult concept mm -hmm. understandable to those of us who aren't CRISPR experts. So great Thank job. Um, so. I'm really fascinated by the idea of the ethical dilemma and the regulation. Could yeah. you give, I mean, I know it doesn't exist, but in the gene editing biological world, is it state level? country level, international, what does regulation look like at all, mm -hmm. even if it's not implemented yet? Like what would that discussion entail? Right, so I don't believe um, at the state level, there's really anything um, regarding those um, sort of, you know, um, bioethical um, regulation. Um, I know that at the country, at the, the national level, you do have, you know, those uh, regulating bodies, um, the FDA, um, I believe the CDC is involved a little bit, um, but you do, yeah, you do have these um, national organizations which um, sort of regulate that at the national level. Um, in China, you do, um, and they sort of enforce those laws. Um, and then at the international level, there is, um, you know, committees of um, bioethicists that gather um, sort of like, you know, political summit um, to discuss um, mostly you know, the, the newer um, techniques that, that are coming out and sort of come to a consensus on, um, you know, the, the ethicalness of um, a lot of these practices. Um, and for the most part, there's no, there's no, um, I would say legislation at the international level. There's no way to enforce that um, besides maybe, um, you know, um, I would say, um, while there's no international like body for, uh, for legislating this, there are, you know, scientific communities that are international, um, and different institutions, which would say, you know, we have these rules for conducting, um, you know, your experiments and that's something that we're going to enforce, but yeah, so those sort of consensuses that are, um, that are decided on at the international level or are implemented more at the national level. Great. Which is why, yeah, there's there's sort of a discrepancy between, um, you know, the American legislation regarding bioethics and then um, the Chinese regulation um, with those um, examples of CRISPR babies. Other questions for Jerry? I can just only imagine how much hope there is in some of these communities with people who are suffering from things like sickle cell, which is mm -hmm. so painful. Um, right. wh where do you think some of these um, uh, uses of Cas9 will be headed? I, I'm assuming they're going to need FDA approval um, to be used. Um, where, where are some of these treatments in that stage of being approved? Um, 
Specifically, I know that there are, with sickle cell anemia, there are human trials being conducted right now. Um, I actually just recently, I watched a video, um, you know, sort of a documentary on um, the implementation of CRISPR-Cas9 in sickle cell treatment. Um, I believe in Nigeria is where they focused on um, the treatment. And um, they interviewed a man who was undergoing this new treatment. And he said, um, you know, it's, it's a complete game changer. Um, because before this, you know, there are, there are actually, you know, very few treatments for sickle cell anemia um, that are accessible and effective. So, um, you know, the, the way that he's been treated, which um, has been to take his bone marrow um, out of his body, treat it with this CRISPR-Cas9 complex, and then reinsert it um, for, for um, future hemoglobin production is actually, uh, actually been very successful. So um, I know, Outside of the United States, there are these, um, you know, human trials going on, and I believe that they're um, they've been going very, very well. Um, and I think that um, I would say within within the next few years, because you know, I'm not I'm not an expert on the um, you know the regulating process and how long that will take to you know pass all the standards, but I believe that it is very close to being implemented, um, you know, on, on a wider scale. There's another question in the chat, Jerry. Uh, has there been any estimate of whether the reduction in methane from CRISPR in crops has had a measurable effect on atmospheric concentrations? Right. So at a global scale, um, I would say no. Um, uh, with, you know, with the, the experimentation that's been going on with these, um, uh, you know, you have sort of these fields of primarily rice. Rice is what's been um, targeted with these um, these uh, emission reducing gene edits. Um, that has been detectable on an experimental level, um, but um, I don't believe it's been implemented on such a wide scale as to have um, a noticeable effect on the global uh, methane emissions. Um, and I believe, I mean, well, first of all, um, rice is very, um, you know, um, a very uh, widespread crop, um, you know, throughout the globe. So that will take a lot of uh, implementation to um, sort of affect, um, you know, the, the global stock of uh, rice, as well as um, I'm sure there are also, uh, there's also research being conducted on other sources of methane um, and, you know, the emission of different um, greenhouse gases um, in other um, organisms. I know that um, cows have been a big talking point for methane emissions. And I'm sure that there's, um, there's uh, you know, continuous research into um, editing even, you know, the genomes of cows to reduce methane emissions, because that's a, you know, that's a very big, um, topic of scientific discussion right now. Questions? Now's the time to ask them. I second Patricia's thought that you really helped to distill something that was not <laughs> something easily digestible for most of us <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. into something that was definitely more understandable. So thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, these interests. Where do you think these interests might take you in the future? You are thinking about a next. Uh, Next step, you're a senior in high school. Anything right. you see yourself doing? <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, that, that's definitely my preferred area of study for college. Um, something I'm really interested in, um, really passionate about. So, you know, I, I see like, you know, you know, doing doing this this sort of research in, you know, gene editing and, you know, um, you know, um, going very in depth in this field, it, it, it's not something that, you know, seems like, um, you know, a chore or some, you know, the strenuous work. Um, it's something that I enjoy. So 
Um, I think that I'll definitely continue to um, pursue some of the applications of this in college um, through research, um, keep up, you know, keep up with, with um, the current research that's going on. And, um, you know, after that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I couldn't really tell you. Um, I don't like to think that far ahead. So, um, you know, right now I'm really interested in it and I intend to um, keep learning about it. You know, there's stuff that is discovered every single day. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why, um, you know, I'm really so in love with the field. It's very dynamic. <laughs> Seems very dynamic. I, I do have another question that came in the chat. Uh, could you say more about any negative effects that have been found thus far from CRISPR? Right. So um, I'll just rehash um, that one specific. Um, no, sorry, right here. Um, that, that one specific um, concern where some studies have found to um, have found that treatment with CRISPR Cas9 has lowered the cancer fighting ability um, of these treated cells. Um, and, uh, you know, the cause of that isn't um necessarily known and you know that that connection isn't um you know completely um proven as of yet but um you know with, with certain off-target effects of crispr cas9 um when you get to having these target sequences so you know the sequence that you specifically want to cut um when that gets shorter and you know um has a lower number of nucleotides in it that's where you can start running into problems with um, unintended um, cuts because you know you you have a you have a, a genome the human genome which has billions and billions of nucleotides in it so um, you know you just think about the the chances of running into um, these two different sequences that have the same you know the same however many nucleotide sequence um, you could have an instance where um, it inadvertently cuts a sequence that wasn't you know, the target of that, that specific um, CRISPR application. And then that can, you know, severely damage um, the, the genome. And then when you also get into, um, you know, editing, um, you know, the embryos of, of specific organisms or um, early in the development process, um, that's when you can also have, you know, serious repercussions if, you know, any minor, um, any minor, um, you know, off-target cuts occur. And also with the homology directed repair, which is crucial to repairing that cut DNA, um, that can also, um, you know, have, have some drastic side effects at that um, early development stage. Because um, if you have, if you have, um, you know, a, a faulty repair of that DNA, even by one, like, you know, uh, one nucleotide, because I'm, I mean, I believe that sickle cell anemia is caused by the mutation of a single nucleotide that can have, you know, widespread effects on, um, the, you know, that organism as it, as it grows and, um, expresses that genome. So, um, I would say that the two main, the two main sources of those, um, unintended consequences are going to be, um, off target cuts, like inadvertent, um, cuts of the, the CRISPR Cas9, which is, because of two, two of the same sequences, um, as well as um, a failure to effectively repair the DNA after it's, be, after it's been cut, which is, you know, a, a serious concern. But, um, you know, I think that every day um, with the, the level of research that goes into CRISPR-Cas9, I think that's becoming more and more um, understood and we're learning sort of how to combat that. Another question. Uh, there, I, I knew we weren't done. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was recent. There has recently been an in increase in al algal blooms in freshwater lakes, linked to health issues in exposed in, in those exposed um, because of toxins released from the algae. Do you think the gene editing has any promise in decreasing the ability for algae to produce toxins? This is a general question. Can CRISPR technology be, be used to eliminate the potential for single cell organisms to express a gene? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, and I like how you mentioned with, with the single cell organisms, 
that is, um, I think, the most effective um, subject for CRISPR-Cas9 editing um, because, you know, when, once you get into eukaryotic organisms and multicellular organisms, um, it's hard to globalize those, those gene editing effects. But with those single-celled organisms, um, if you affect that genome, um, you know, at, just at the cellular level, that will reproduce um, for, you know, exponentially growing later generations, um, that edited genome. And um, with the, the algal bloom, yes, um, that is something that can definitely be co uh, combated with CRISPR-Cas9 editing. Um, just at, at the fundamental level, um, I believe that the toxin would be caused by a specific gene within, within that genome, which produces the toxin as a response to probably an environmental condition or just as a process of its, of its growth. And um, no matter what the cause, if that can be identified, um, it can certainly certainly be directed to be cut out by CRISPR-Cas9. And um, what I would say that the, the current um, holdup would be with implementing that, that gene edit would be, um, it, it would be sort of difficult to, um, you know, uh, you could say, like uh, uh, how I said, globalize. Um, it would be hard to sort of implement that, that gene edit for, um, you know, billions of algal cells, which could, um, you know, occupy even, you know, a, a cubic liter of water, um, a very small amount. So um, I believe that maybe, maybe the proper route would be sort of first starting to find a way to kill off a, a vast majority of these um, algal colonies, and then finding a, a smaller set of, you um, you know, a treatment group where you can edit, edit that genome and then sort of reproduce that in, you know, the wider environment. Um, but yes, that is treatable. Um, the only problem is sort of, um, you know, making that, making that have a widespread effect over the, you know, the entire community of those algal cells. More questions for Jerry. You guys have had some really good ones. All right. Well, speak now forever, hold your peace. No, uh, until the next time we have Jerry on. Um, well, Jerry, thank you so much. This was, I just, I'm amazed at what I learned. <laughs> um, and, and I do think that um, kind of explaining it, maybe, take some of the fear out of it. I think people get a little like, they get nervous about headlines, um, but they don't, you know, completely understand, um, you know, what, what they're really talking about. So thank you for making that understandable for us. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I was so passionate about researching it because, you know, it was something that was very intimidating to me at first. Um, and I sort of just wanted to, you know, have that be able to translate that into simpler terms from for my own mind to sort of understand how it relates to my biology curriculum and um yeah i mean i had a great time um sort of uh talking about that and you know teaching something is the best way to learn it too so um i had you know a very fun and beneficial uh time sharing that well we're expecting great things from you jerry um and Again, thank you everybody for attending. Um, I have recorded this uh, and it will uh, end up on uh, the front page of the library's website. That's www.haverfordlibrary.org. It should be in the, you know, missed a program uh, and there'll be a, a, a hyperlink um, on that page so that you can find it. It's, it's basically going to be on YouTube. Uh, give me about a day to, to load it up. Um, and then you can share it with anybody else uh, who's trying to make sense of uh, what CRISPR technology is. So um, again, thanks for, for coming, everybody, um, and have a great night.